Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today. And I thought we would chat a bit about environmental legislation. As we get close to the APES exam, it'd be a good idea to start reviewing some of those laws that you need to have in your back pocket as you go into that test. So I thought I'd put together a little video that kind of runs you through the major ones and the needs to knows of each. So that's what we're going to do today. We're just going to do a quick run through of the environmental legislation. I'll tell you that there's probably about 18 laws or acts that you need to be aware of. So sit back, grab something to write on, and here we go. First thing I want to talk about, though, is the fact that environmental law is rarely proactive. And what I mean by that is legislation about the environment, unfortunately, is not generally put in place until something has gone terribly wrong, or at least in America, this is the way it is. Now, in Europe, they oper operate according to the uh, precautionary principle that basically says, let's put some laws in place to stop problems before they actually happen. America, we say, well, let's go ahead, and then if there is a problem, we'll go ahead and make some laws about it. So at least in America, our legislation is rarely proactive. Usually it's in response to some sort of disaster. So I'm just going to go ahead now and tick through a bunch of different pieces of legislation that you need to, go, need to know. Hopefully you can keep up. First one that you need to be aware of is CERCLA, also known as the Superfund Act. And like I was just talking about, legislation is often put forth in response to a disaster. Superfund was put forth in response to the Love Canal uh, toxic dumping problem. So CERCLA, or the Superfund Act, puts taxes on petroleum and chemical industries in order to pay for toxic site cleanup. And this is specifically sites that have been abandoned. So let's say there used to be a factory that manufactured textiles. They produced a bunch of chemicals, but the factory was abandoned. Let's say the business crashed or something like that and everybody left, nobody cleaned up the mess. That site would be designated as a Superfund site because there's nobody taking responsibility for the cleanup of that area. So the thought behind CERCLA is that putting taxes on petroleum companies and chemical companies pulls in the money that would be needed to clean up those Superfund sites. Problem is, around America right now, there are more Superfund sites than there are dollars to clean them up. Next act to be aware of is the Antarctic Treaty. This is also known as the Madrid Protocol. We did not talk about this one in class, but it's one for you to be aware of. Um, basically what it did is it set aside the continent of Antarctica as a scientific preserve and it banned military activity. This protocol was put in place recognizing that Antarctica is a unique place. There's no other place on Earth that is like it. It's the only continent not inhabited by humans originally. So scientists, the UN, the global uh, scientific community basically said, let's set Antarctica aside as a scientific preserve and set it up as a haven for research. So that would be the Madrid Protocol. Clean Air Act. This one is as easy as its name sounds. It deals with air pollution and air quality. The big thing that it did is it set standards for six criteria air pollutants. Now, if you go back to the video I shot about air pollution, I go through those six pollutants, but some of them include SOx and NOx, VOCs, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, um, and I think there's probably a couple others that I'm forgetting, but there are six major criteria air pollutants that the EPA monitors, and if they find the concentration of a specific pollutant to be too high, they'll put out air quality warnings. They also might look at industries that are producing those chemicals and try to regulate them a little bit. I believe that a couple more air pollutants have been added, so it's more than six now, but just know that the Clean Air Act set a basic standard for air quality. Then there's the Clean Water Act, which is like Clean Air Act. They came about in the same time period. Um, the thought behind the Clean Water Act was that it was to govern the pollution of the nation's waterways. So Clean Water Act deals with surface water. There's going to be water on the surface of the earth. It's going to include lakes, streams, ponds, estuaries, marshes, things like that. Um, it monitors the pollutant levels in those waters and it sets regulation in place that prevents industries from polluting waterways. Convention on Climate Change, otherwise known as the Kyoto Protocol. I got a pagoda there because that is in Kyoto, Japan. That's where this conference happened. And know that the Kyoto Protocol at the moment is probably the most far-reaching environmental legislation that's put into place, at least on the global scale. The big deal behind the Kyoto Protocol was that 
required mandatory emission limitations on signatory nations. So that basically means that any nation that signed on to the Kyoto Protocol agreed to limit their greenhouse gas emissions by a certain percentage. The overall goal of the conference was to get global emissions down 5.2% below the levels they were at in 1990. Most of the weight was put on developed nations to reduce their emissions. Uh, interesting caveat to the Kyoto Protocol, America, Australia never signed on to it, so we weren't bound by it, even though we are significant polluters. There have been efforts since the Kyoto Conference to update the Kyoto Protocol, but thus far they have been unsuccessful. Montreal Protocol would be the next of the protocols to be aware of. This one was successful. Um, the Montreal Protocol came out of a conference about CFCs, ozone depleting chemicals. Montreal Protocol basically banned the production and use of chlorofluorocarbons or those chemicals that get into the atmosphere and deplete the ozone layer. It was very successful. From the time that the Montreal Protocol was put into place, CFC concentrations rose slightly and then since they have dropped significantly. As those CFC concentrations are dropping, the amount of ozone in the atmosphere, specifically stratospheric ozone, has been increasing. So Montreal Protocol, CFCs. Then there's CITES, not cities, CITES. CITES is the most far-reaching legislation that uh, was put in place in regard to endangered animals or endangered species. CITES Treaty banned international trade of endangered species. So there is an international list of species that are considered to be endangered. If you are caught trading in these species, whether it's within your own country, across country borders, or even internationally, then there are usually heavy fines and penalties to be paid. Now, one thing to recognize about the CITES Treaty is its effective implementation is dependent on the country. Some countries are very hard about regulating this. They do a good job of watching poaching and transport of illegal animals. They jail the offenders. They fine them. Other treaties that are not other treaties, other countries that have got maybe a little bit looser government system or police force or not the resources to implement it, obviously have a harder time regulating trade in illegal wildlife. Stockholm Declaration. This is one of the most, I keep saying far reaching, so I won't say far reaching, but this is one of the environmental conventions that actually had international support. It's also one of the first declarations that were put into place about the environment. And basically what it did is it set a common outlook and a common guide for the world with regard to environmental preservation. So basically to the world it said we need to take care of our waterways, we need to take care of our air, we need to preserve wild places, we need to make sure that the biodiversity of the world is kept constant or even or even improved. It was agreed on by most countries that were involved in the conference, and that's all it was. There weren't any uh, specific guidelines set out with it. There wasn't any legislation set out with it. It was just basically a statement of the world believes that protecting the environment is important. Endangered Species Act, and I think we're going to do a couple acts now about wildlife in, de in general. The Endangered Species Act prohibits the government from carrying out or funding any activities that jeopardize the continued survival of an endangered species. That's a mouthful. Basically it says that the government cannot do any building projects or I don't know just any projects that are going to harm the habitat or the animals themselves within an endangered species. Examples of this are <clears throat> some solar projects that were slated to go out in the desert of Nevada would have messed up the habitat of an endangered tortoise that lives out there so the government wasn't able to carry out that project. Um, in some cases the construction of a dam for hydroelectricity has not been able to go forward because of endangered fish populations that live in that stream. So basically it says that the government has to either relocate those animals or put their building project somewhere else if it is going to endanger whatever animals are in the area. Lacey Act prohibits transport of illegally captured animals across state lines. So this is kind of like the CITES Treaty American style. So where CITES says you can't trade internationally in endangered animals or illegally captured animals, the Lacey Act is specific to America. So you cannot transport uh, illegally captured animals around America and across state lines.
Marine Mammal Protection Act is exactly what it sounds like. It was put in place in order to protect marine mammals. Marine mammals would include things like sea otters, manatees, dolphins, whales, porpoises. It prohibits U.S. citizens from taking, capturing, or harassing marine mammals. So if you are boating down in Florida, you can't mess with those manatees because it is illegal under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. National Environmental Policy Act, also known as NEPA, establishes requirements for EIS. EIS stands for Environmental Impact Statements and Environmental Statements for Large Building Projects. So if the government is going to carry out a building project, it could be road construction, it could be construction of an airport or a building in some urban area or a building in some suburban area. The <clears throat> building party has to create an environmental impact statement, which basically lays out all of the environmental impacts of the project. Now, interesting thing is, they can lay out all of the environmental impacts, but there aren't any requirements that say they have to take the most environmentally friendly path. Basically, they just have to recognize, all right, this is what we are going to do to the environment, and then they can go ahead with their work if their EIS is approved. So National Environmental Policy Act requires the production of environmental impact statements for large-scale building projects. Toxic Substances Control Act allows the EPA to regulate existing chemicals and new chemicals before they reach market. This act recognized that chemical companies are always producing new chemicals, obviously, they're chemical companies, and a lot of those chemicals that are produced either are known to be dangerous or could possibly be dangerous. So this law allows the EPA to test those chemicals, to require regulation of those chemicals, to recall chemicals if they are found to be unduly harmful to people or the environment. This applies to both new chemicals that are being manufactured and chemicals that have already been manufactured and are on the market. So if a chemical that has been out for a while is found to be dangerous after a number of years, the EPA can put regulations on that chemical or recall it altogether. Safe Drinking Water Act is the counterpart to the Clean Water Act. So Clean Water Act deals with waterways, ponds, streams, etc. Safe Drinking Water Act deals specifically with municipal water supplies, so the water within a city. And it gives the EPA the power to set national drinking water standards. So they would say, here's the acceptable level of arsenic in drinking water, or here's the acceptable level of chlorine in drinking water, or whatever chemical they are watching at the time. It allows the EPA to set that standard and then regulate and assess and fine and work with cities based on those standards. So if a city's water supply is found to be in violation of the standards set forth in the Safe Drinking Water Act, then the EPA may be speaking with them. And know that those standards change over time. As chemicals are found to be more dangerous or less dangerous, the act and the regulations are adjusted accordingly. Service Mining Control and Reclamation Act deals with mining, and its specific intent was to reduce the environmental impact of mining. So it requires that, environment, that mining operations be carried out in a way that does minimal damage to the environment. It also requires that when a mining operation has ceased, that the land be reclaimed. So if it's a pit mine, it needs to be filled in and planted over the top. Strip mine, same thing. If there are tailings, those need to be removed and dealt with. If there are waterways that have been damaged, that needs to be addressed. Um, this is all about mining and making sure that it does as little damage to the environment as possible. Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. I believe this is probably our last one for the day. This protects public from harm caused by waste disposal and it implemented a cradle to grave tracking system of waste. So basically RCRA recognized that a lot of times waste, solid waste, toxic waste is not disposed of properly. So it set basic guidelines for the disposal of specific types of waste. It also gave the EPA a framework for tracking chemicals and other to toxic substances from the time that they are produced through their useful life and then through to their disposal. So that would be known as cradle to grave tracking, tracking from when they were first created all the way through to the time at which they were disposed of. So that's it. Those are the laws and acts and protocols that you need to be aware of. Rewind, check them out, make sure that you can talk about each one in class. I'll give you a bunch of review resources. If you're just watching us online, if you Google APES Legislation Review, you'll find tons of worksheets, lots of games, lots of stuff to help you out. So with that, I'm Mr. Kite. This has been the Lab 207 webcast. Good luck on your AP environmental exams. Hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.